our bodies are made up of parts, right? We've got billions of cells inside our body. Now, the key thing to, to really understand here is that inside our cells, we have one nucleus and lots and lots of mitochondria, okay? So we're just going to have a look at the function of each of those things. The function of the nucleus, it's like the brain of your cell. It's that control center. It's where all of, almost all of our genes are stored. It's where your nuclear DNA comes from. And that's why when you talk about nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA, it's called nuclear DNA because it lives in the nucleus. And that's where it stays, that control center of the cell. Now, the nucleus contains about 25,000 or so genes. The mitochondria, as we're all very well familiar with, is the powerhouse of the cell. And its role is converting food into energy, into the type of energy that our cells can use. Our cell can't do its function with sugar. Our body takes that sugar in and our mitochondria then convert that into ATP, which then allows our cells to do whatever it is they're wanting to do. Now, the mitochondria is a very unique organelle in that it has its own genome as well. Genome is a word that um, I will be using. And what a genome is, it's basically a complete set of your genetic instructions. So in humans, we have our genome contains the full nuclear set of instructions and the mitochondrial instructions. Now, if you think of these genetic instructions, so what actually are they? Picture your DNA is this master cookbook, right? This cookbook contains every single recipe that your body needs to function, that it needs for survival, right? And there's at least 25,000 recipes in this book, maybe more. Now, if you also think about this, this master cookbook, I've talked about this the nucleus and how it stays in there. Imagine that there's this busy restaurant with lots and lots of different kitchens or different chefs all over the place and they're all doing lots of things. Now, if you had one big master cookbook that you passed over to your pastry chef and your sous chef and the person prepping the salads and this, you're gonna, it, it's at risk of damage, isn't it? You could be splashed with bolognese sauce. It could get too close to the gas hot plate. So to preserve and protect this important master cookbook, we have these, um, sorry, yeah, we'll get back to that. To preserve and protect this master cookbook, when it comes to the individual recipes that we need, which is the genes, we have these little compounds, these RNAs, that come and make a photocopy and distribute it to where it's needed. So the master cookbook stays locked up in its storeroom in the nucleus. It doesn't move around. And there's all these little photocopies going back and forward and sending off the recipes to where it's needed in the, the cell to actually have... It's, it's function, if that makes sense, right? So the key point to understand there is sometimes when we're hearing about genetics, some people are talking about your DNA or your RNA. They might be talking about transcription and translation. There's a lot of complex words in genetics. It's a whole different language sometimes. But your DNA stays put in your nucleus. That RNA is these little photocopies of the this, of this, uh, recipes, of the genes, that are then sent in and out to all the different kitchens for them to make their finished product, which could be a delicious cherry pie, but ultimately the product that they're making is a protein. Then proteins carry out a specific function to do whatever they need to do in order to survive. So coming back to that word genome, and I mentioned we've got two of those in a cell. Our nuclear genome, there's one per cell. Inside your one nucleus and your nuclear genome, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chromosomes, it's almost like 23 volumes of this cookbook, right? It's all the information, 23 chapters, 23 volumes, however you want to describe it. So every single gene you generally have two copies of, one from mum, one from dad. They might both be a working copy, right? Or you might have one that doesn't work, or you might have two that doesn't work. The thing about nuclear genome is it's easy for us to understand. Once we know what a gene does, there's zero, one or two, we can then figure out 
what that's going to look like or what that's going to mean. I've mentioned already there's about 25,000 genes in there. And of those, about 1,200 of them are associated with mitochondrial function. And this is just to introduce this whole concept of how can mitochondrial disease be caused by nuclear changes or mitochondrial changes? Because there's at least 1,200 genes in the nuclear um, genome that are associated with mitochondrial function. Now, the mitochondrial genome, on the other hand, there's many, 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 many mitochondria per cell. Practically every cell in our body, except for our mature red blood cells, contains your mitochondria. Now, unlike the nuclear where we've got these 23 pairs, we've got some from mum and some from dad, when it comes to the mitochondria, it's one single ring chromosome. And we've seen that image come up in a few other presentations that we've had, okay? There's just one chromosome that only comes from mum and it only contains 37 genes, all of which are associated with mitochondrial function. That first note there, many mitochondria per cell, just to really hone in on that, even your female egg cell, which goes on to develop and become a baby if it's fertilized, that one cell alone contains between 200,000 to 500,000 mitochondria. So you know how I mentioned with a nuclear cell, a nuclear gene, we've either got, you know, one working, zero working copies, one working copy or two working copies, and we can kind of understand what that means. Imagine when there's 500,000 copies of something and the complexity there with trying to figure out what does that mean? 